Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, to be here with you folks. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to you. All right. Well, I'm glad to be here again in fellowship with God's people. And uh, an opportunity for you to uh, share what you you're thankful for this morning. Don't worry, it's part of the sermon. So um, I won't add to the message and, and time that I've been allotted. Uh, but uh, I'll take that into consideration uh, as I consider what I've prepared here. But I want to give you folks an opportunity to share uh, what you're thankful for this morning. Um, Jody, we're glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, welcome. I can see Rob's not with you. He's back uh, guarding the fort. Yes. All right. All right. But you brought some, brought some friends with you. Uh, my sister and um, our our uh, future cousin. <laughs> oh, okay. Your future cousin. Oh, okay. Congratulations. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> All right. Well, welcome, folks. Thank you. Okay. Opportunity to give thanks. Uh, I'm going to give uh, give us a few minutes here. Who will be first? What are you thankful for this morning? For family. For family. All right. And future family? <laughs> future yes. family. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. so much I don't have time to say it all. All right. Why don't you start count, counting your blessings, eh? Yeah. They start just yeah. ringing up. Pat. That the Lord chose me to be his child. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. The Lord is great that he would choose such a sinner as you or I. Amen. They all said amen. <laughs> Others? Debbie? For a job. For a job. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's things we need to be thankful for and usually when we don't have them we realize all that. Fred? And Shep? Sorry, Pastor Fred. Ah. Amen. For everything, for, but especially for his mercy and his grace. For his grace. Oh. Okay. His love endures forever. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the Lord that we live in a free country. Um, may our government uh, be lopsided and we can still be thankful that uh, we have free free thinking people and that we're not mm -hmm. locked up or chained up or beaten or mm -hmm. in uh, dire stresses. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're pretty lucky in this mm -hmm. country and we just thank God for all of us that we have the country we live in. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Indeed. We have much to be thankful for in this nation. Yes, Marcel? Uh, I'd like to thank the Lord for family too, uh, especially for the family of God mm -hmm. and the help that I've been getting from Nancy with my pension and my uh, uh, papers and that for the government. Yeah, I'm definitely thankful for uh, for family because they got me, uh, my parents, all of them there, teaching me the ways of the Lord, and for my brothers and sister. Thank you for all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robbie. We're thankful to you as well. That's our son, and the brother that you are. I'd like to thank the Lord for my salvation. I'd like to thank the Lord for my family and my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to visit my aunt uh, next, next this coming week, which is going to be 98. So uh, I thank you for being very good and good health. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank the Lord that no matter what happens, He's in control. Because if I would, I'd mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> we can be thankful for the Lord's sovereignty. Amen. Lord, uh, thank you for my family, my beautiful wife, my children. And my extended family, my church family, and my uh, natural born family. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many of us. Fancy. Well, I'm very thankful for my 
family as well. I'm right. very thankful for the Lord placing Brooke in my life and just how much I reference that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in this country we have four seasons. And I'm thankful for the four seasons. Mm -hmm. Really? And, <laughs> yes, I am. and this, year, this fall, uh, the Lord has his paintbrush out on these branches. We live in kind of like three valleys. Uh, it is probably the best I've ever seen in my life. It is, the mountains are just a blaze. Yeah, all foliage. No, well, it's, it's, it's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, we can enjoy God's creation. Mm -hmm. handy work. These houses are turned down down here, like where we live. Uh, it's it's yeah. just totally awesome. Yeah. Even the, even the trees this year that generally have really poor colors, they're even good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. That's good. It's great that we can enjoy uh, God's creation, and you can give God the glory for that. It's handy work. Right. Is that it? I want to thank you for, for my help mm -hmm. and Paul's help and mm -hmm. the love we share together. Yeah. All right. mm -hmm. I'm Good thankful day. for God's presence in my life, knowing that no matter what comes or goes, He's steady, He's always there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great is life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brother Tony. I'd like to thank the Lord for the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Thank you right. for all the blessings that we take for granted that we don't even know we have. Yeah, that's right. Oftentimes, eh, well, that's why we've taken opportunity and we should do this in our own lives, taking stock every day about the things that we do uh, God has blessed us with. But as, I, as I've been listening to you folks and you're giving thanks, I think thanksgiving to a degree is putting things in perspective. And keeping things in perspective is what we want to consider, even this morning, because so often um, we don't take time to be thankful, but we have to learn to be thankful. And sometimes God puts things in our path that will remind us how thankful we need to be. I'm reminded of the story in Budapest, a man goes to the rabbi and complains, life is unbearable. There are nine of us living in one room. What can I do? The rabbi answers, take your goat into the room with you. The man, incredulous, but the, the rabbi insists, do as I say and come back in a week. A week later, the man comes back looking more distraught than before. <laughs> we cannot stand it, he tells the rabbi. The goat is filthy. The rabbi then tells him, go home and let the goat out, and come back in a week. A radiant man returns to the rabbi a week later, exclaiming, life is beautiful. We enjoy every minute of it, now that there's no goat, only the nine of us. <laughs> it's all about perspective. It wasn't so bad after all. The goat was a good object lesson. We need to be thankful. And uh, sometimes God does that to us. He sends a goat along our way. <laughs> and uh, that's there to remind us what we need to be thankful for. What we need to consider as being thankful. As I've pre been preparing this message and thinking about Thanksgiving, we use Thanksgiving in this day as an opportunity to give thanks for many reasons. Thank to thank God, undoubtedly, to look to Him. But does thanksgiving um, as a celebration have, a, have biblical support? As an occasion, a celebration, a festival? Let me share this story in, in the introduction. Take it, uh, this story is taken from Rabbi Elias Lieberman. I have the great good fortune to live in Cape Cod, just a short drive from Plymouth Plantation. It was there in the Plymouth settlement that history records the first Thanksgiving. The intervening centuries have made it difficult to sort fact from Hallmark fiction, but this much we do know. From one 
contemporaneous account from 1621. So we're going back. Remember the friendly giant? Remember that show? He used to say, look up, look up, look yeah. way up. <laughs> well, we're going to be going look back, look back, look way back. We're starting here at 1621, but we're going to go further back. There were, he says in 1621, there were three days of feasting in the company of Native Americans. <coughs> While we cannot be certain about what motivated those pilgrim settlers to initiate a feast of thanksgiving, it is likely that they consciously drew on a model well known to them from the Bible they cherish. Seeing themselves as new Israelites in a new promised land, the pilgrims surely found inspiration in the Bible, in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, in which God commands the ancient Israelites to observe the feasts of Booth, or the feast of Tabernacle, or the feast of Ingathering, as it's known. In Jewish tradition, the festival of Sukkot, which means Booth, is a joyous occasion to give thanks and praise to the source of creation for the bounty we enjoy. In fact, we're told that during Sukkot, you, you shall have nothing but joy. Deuteronomy 1615, Jews erect a Sukkot, and that's a harvest booth. And religious Jews would be doing that today, this week, because this week it's a seven-day feast that's going on right now. Uh, it's, it, it begins at the 15th of the month Tishri, which this is the month Tishri for them. And uh, it started last Monday and it will go to this Monday, where some of them will even erect booths in warmer climates and stay in them for seven days. It was a temporary structure hung with fruits and symbols of harvest season. Its roof is thinly covered with branches, admitting sunlight, starlight, wind and rain, reminding us of the precariousness of our existence in the face of the forces of nature. But the Saka is also a powerful reminder of the many reasons for which we feel grateful to God, not the least of which is the fact that for the other 51 weeks of the year, most of us are blessed to have solid roofs over our heads, clothes to wear, and food enough to fill our bellies. But such was not always the case for the pilgrims, who often contended with eager illness, meager rations, disappoint, disappointed hopes, and death. During that very hard winter before the first Thanksgiving, it was recorded that food became so scarce in some settlements that the daily ration of food per person per day was five kernels of corn. Not cops, kernels. In order to remember those harsh times and maintain their gratitude for the plenty they now enjoy, some New Englanders started the custom of putting five kernels of corn on each plate of their uh, feast. Few of us today are farmers. We gather our food prepackaged from the supermarket, far removed from the natural processes which make or break a harvest. But Thanksgiving and Sakat come to remind us that there is far more to be grateful for in this world than a bountiful crop. Both of, both of these splendid holidays encourage us to stop and acknowledge the manifold blessings God bestows upon us each and every day. So with that as an introduction, <coughs> and looking back to the first Thanksgiving, or the first time in which it was stated, we need to turn our Bibles back to um, Leviticus chapter 23, also in Deuteronomy 16, Numbers 29, and Exodus 23. They all deal with the last feast. This is referred to as the greatest feast of the Feast of Jehovah, as they referred to in Leviticus chapter 23, the Feast of Tabernacles. This was a feast of celebration. Remember, the other feast that was just five days prior to this feast beginning on the 10th of Tishri was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And that was a, a day of mourning and sadness. Rosh Hashanah was the, on the first trip to Tishri where there was uh, the Feast of Trumpets, where they were blowing the trumpet. But that was to prepare the people 
a time of reflection, thinking about uh, themselves and looking inwardly and saying, what have I done? How have I wronged God? And of course, the Day of Atonement, ten days later, on the 10th of Tishri, there would be great mourning, and the, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. That was a time of sadness and sorrow. But now, five days later, the 15th of Tishri, which was the 1st of October this year, there's a time of rejoicing, a time of celebration, a time of giving thanks, a time of peace, and a time of rest. So as we think of Thanksgiving, and we have the biblical account going back to the Thanksgiving of the Feast of Tabernacles, we're reminded that it's a time of giving thanks. But putting things in perspective, thanks to who? For what reasons? It celebrated the time the Israelites spent in the wilderness, living in tents, thanksgiving for God's care and provision for them when they experienced the worst time of their lives. Hence, this was the most joyous of feasts for them. But it came at a difficult time as well, in their wilderness wanderings for 40 years. And they dwelt in tents, no permanent structure. They just trusted in God from day to day to day. And God provided miraculously. The Feast of Tab Tabernacles was only five days after the Feast of Atonement, which was a fast. The pain now gone from fasting, it was a time for great joy. What's the lesson? That pain won't last. It will be replaced with rejoicing. For the Bible says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. In this life, it's guaranteed that there will be weeping. And we all are confronted with the trials and tribulations, the sadness and sorrow, the tears and the temptations that are out there, and the failures of Lord life's journey. And we can become so discouraged and downtrodden, even depressed. But joy cometh in the morning. You see, the Feast of Tabernacles, as we think of Thanksgiving, this Thanksgiving was a time of being reminded that God is sovereign, yes. God is in control, yes. God provides, yes. And we can be encouraged with celebrating who God is. When all around us there may be uh, sorrow and sadness. How does the... How does the Lord want us to, to approach thanksgiving day? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the last of the books of Moses, chapter 16. Leanne read from Leviticus chapter 23. Thank you for that reading, uh, Leanne. <coughs> because Leviticus chapter 23 talks about all of the feasts. It goes through all of them through the calendar year, the Hebrew calendar year, beginning with the first feast, uh, which was, of course, the Passover feast. Deuteronomy chapter 16, beginning to read at verse 13. You shall observe the feast of tabernacles. In total, this feast lasted eight days. Seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your winepress. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, and the Levite, the stranger and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce, in all, excuse me, produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you surely rejoice. 
So here as we read this passage of scripture, again it's speaking about um, the, the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. But here we see what? It wasn't, if we can fast forward to this day, it wasn't, ah, uh, I gotta go to church again? Is that all we do around here? No. It was time to go to church again. Hot dog! <laughs> the, the word, the, end, the key word is celebrate in verse 14. And you shall rejoice. It seems to be almost a command. And if we turn our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says rejoice. Be thankful in all things, for this is the will of God. It is a command. So we are actually disobeying the, the scriptures when we don't rejoice. It's a choice that we make. So we need to reflect upon that. That is still true today. You can choose to shut out the problems and focus on God. Or think about them to the point of crowding God out. All people were called to celebrate and rejoice as well. As we read in this passage of scripture, we see that there was the fatherless and the widow. They were, they were undoubtedly going through difficult times. The stranger. The poor. The weak. They were all mentioned there. But for what reason? To celebrate. No excuses that we can reflect upon the goodness of God, no matter what our circumstances are. It was called to be a celebration. God is not dull. He wishes our life with Him to be full of celebration and joy. To, to be excited about who God is and what He's done. I want to talk about another Thanksgiving. Let's go fast forward a few hundred years, about to 951 B.C., getting back to our friend Solomon. And we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, this was a passage of scripture that was in your bulletins, I believe. Yeah, but we didn't read it for that one because we read uh, from Leviticus 23, and we were speaking about the tabernacle, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles there. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, this is another thanksgiving, many years later. But what happens on this occasion? Verse beginning to read verse 2. Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel in Jerusalem, that they might bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord up from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore, all the men of Israel assembled with the king at the feast, which was in the seventh month. This is speaking about the Feast of Tabernacles, because it says in another chapter that it was seven days. And there's only one feast that lasts seven days in the, month, in, in, in the seventh month of Tishri, and that's the Feast of Tabernacles. So by process of elimination, we read very clearly and understand that it's a celebration time. Everyone was there in Jerusalem, well the males were especially. But what was, what was so significant about this Thanksgiving that it says, look at chapter 5 verse 1, so all the work that Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. Solomon was known and was recognized for so many things. But first and foremost was his building of the temple. And it was built. And it was ready. And Solomon waited for a specific time. The Feast of Tabernacles. Where there is a time of rejoicing. The ark or which the temple which was to replace the ark and be that permanent structure which represented the presence of God. The place where God revealed himself to the people. 
So how did they respond during this, uh, this Thanksgiving? Look at verse 13. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers, Jan and Eddie and Lisa, were as one to make one sound to be heard. And everybody, all the congregation, heard one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Someone said that, just thanking the Lord this morning for it. He's good for His love, His mercies or His love endures forever. That the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. This was a real worship service. So that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For what, was, what does the cloud represent? The glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Isn't that a wonderful statement? What a thanksgiving this is. Wish I could have been there for that. The glory of the Lord. The cloud was so thick. People didn't know what to do. They stopped because they were just blown away, awestruck by the glory of the Lord. That's what thanksgiving should result in for you and I. It's because of the glory of the Lord. It's not simple, hollow thanksgiving on a shallow level. The greatest thanks that we can offer is to God. The greatest thing that God can do for us is to reveal His glory. That we would be humbled by who He is. That would cause us to be drawn to Him. The priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Is that possible for you and I today to experience that wonderful blessings of the glory of the Lord? I believe so. I don't think God is just a God of the past. I think God is a God of the present. God is a God of the future. God is eternal. And the same God who revealed His glory back then wants to reveal His glory to you and I. For He is good. His mercy endures forever. And look at, they were all of one heart and one mind collectively. Not individually, but collectively. And true, true revival. This is a revival. You see it, you feel it, because you see that everybody's on the same page. In being humbled before God. There's another Thanksgiving, though. You know, I like to talk about my Thanksgiving stories, about when I was a child going, going here and going there, and all the kids being together, and all the... Uh, Older folks being together. Now I'm an older folk. I'm going to be with the older folks. Today. I'm talking about boring stuff while the kids are having fun. I graduated. Oh boy. But um, God gives us some Thanksgiving stories. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Let, let's kind of wrap it all up. Our time has passed us by so quickly. And we still have the Lord's table that we do not want to minimize what a precious opportunity we have this morning to partake of the Lord's table. But just, I want to talk about one more Thanksgiving. In John chapter 7, look at it says, beginning to read in verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So there were many people again in Jerusalem. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known only openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. It says for even his brothers, Jesus half-brothers, did not believe him. But 
going down, Jesus at first was reluctant to go there, but he does. He ends up going to the um, going to the place where the festival is and the celebration. And you see what happens is it says this going further down in this chapter. In verse 37, this is how it's referred to, the, the Thanksgiving feast. On the last day, it's, a, it's an eight-day festival. The last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. This is the most important thanksgiving, because the most important invitation is being offered that we need to take heed today. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What a, the greatest invitation. It's not simply a celebration. Maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, I can't really celebrate these, this Thanksgiving as it's being proclaimed. Because I really don't know who Jesus is. Jesus is making an invitation here. He's saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is what makes thanksgiving so precious to the Christian. is because the life that God has given us, the eternal life, the abundant life, the idea of water, rivers of water, of living water, flowing rivers of living water in this desert land, desert world, all the things that we go through, there's this, there's this water of life that is in us. And of course he's referring to the Holy Spirit as it goes on to say. The Spirit of God. <coughs> Spirit of God. Sometimes it seems, it seems so complex, our lives. And so difficult to understand. On the one hand, we may be going through difficult times and trials. But on the other hand, there's something inside of us as Christians saying, pray to God, call on God, give thanks to God. One of the great perplexities of paradoxes is that we can still give thanks to God even when we're going through difficult times. And that's a privilege that God has given each and every one of us. Thanksgiving, the invitation. This is this is an this is a a thanksgiving we all need to consider. Because as we go on to read in this chapter, there was a debate now what they were going to do with Jesus and what he said. Look at verse 40. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Mm -hmm. Has not the scripture, the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So, look at verse 43. So there was a division among the people because of him. Not everybody was on the same page. Not like 900, over 900 years earlier when everybody was on the same page where they, the glory of God, they were just blown away by that worship in the temple. This time around, the response was divided. What is your response to the invitation that Jesus is offering, offering you today? Believe on me, he said. Martin Luther says this, the life of Christianity consists of positive pronouns. It is one thing to say Christ is Savior. It is quite another thing to say He is my Savior and my Lord. Mm -hmm. The devil can say the first Christ is the Savior. The true Christian alone can say the second Christ is my Savior. He's my Lord. I trust this morning this Thanksgiving most importantly, you can say, Christ is my Savior. He's my Lord. If we remember the thief on the cross that turned to Jesus, the thief had nails through both hands so that he could not work. And a nail through each foot 
so that he could not run errands for the Lord. He could not lift a hand or foot toward his salvation. And yet Christ offered him the gift of God. And he took it. Christ threw his passport and he took him into paradise that very night. Salvation is not earned or worked for. It's the gift of God that's offered. As it was offered, Jesus made that invitation at that Thanksgiving so long ago, that offer is still available for each one today. <coughs> we can be encouraged with thanksgiving. And the biblical accounts of thanksgiving, looking at the Feast of Tabernacles, I trust this morning that you can truly say, Jesus is my, my Lord, Jesus is my Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the lessons that we can learn from your word. Even on this topic of thanksgiving, that's for so many it's simply a holiday, another day off, another day to uh, maybe party longer or do other things. That even family can be a distraction from worshiping you, O oh God. But may we, may we put our priorities in order. And first and foremost, look to you and give thanks to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The one who made that invitation so long ago. And he said, believe in me. No one else but believe in me. So I pray this morning. But Lord, in your grace and your mercy, you would call to yourself that those who hear the voice, the still silent voice of God, calling them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 At this time, we'll partake of the Lord's name.